if we, if we were to compute the optimal portfolio given the, uh, the risk and return of individual stocks, how do we know that you won't want to hold negative quantities of some assets? Uh, so that's what's called a short sale. You can, uh, in, in most countries of the world, you can hold negative quantities of a stock just as well as you can hold positive quantities. If you get one of those uh, online uh, brokerage service uh, sites, you have to maybe sign up for a special account to do short sales. But you can say, I'd like to short the stock. So how do you own a negative quantity of a stock? What it means is you borrow the shares and you sell them. Now you owe the share to someone else. The, the uh, stockbroker can help you do that, and it's very routine these days. Well, <laughs> for centuries it's been very routine. Um, most investors don't do it. So you could buy a negative quantity of a stock. Why would you do that? Well, you would do that uh, in disregarding the cap M that we're talking about. You, you might say you would do that if you think the price is going to go down. If the stock is overpriced, it doesn't look good. Instead of not buying it, I'll buy a negative quantity of it. The capital asset pricing model assumes that, yeah, you can, borrow, you can buy positive or negative amounts. Let's find the optimal portfolio. But then it turns out, however, that if you really take the idea to heart that everyone would do the same thing, no stock could ever have an optimal holding of a negative number because there would be a negative holding for everybody and everyone would want to short it and that can't add up. Uh, so uh, we're going to allow short sales in our math but we'll assume that they won't happen, not uh, on, on average. Here's why short sales won't happen. In our model, the optimal portfolio decision of all investors in equilibrium will be symmetric or identical. Uh, given that, we can conclude that no single investor will ever short a stock in equilibrium because then everybody in our model would be shorting that stock. Which brings up the question, who is providing the stock for you to short? So uh, what I'm really coming up to is a kind of abstract model. And I'd like to talk about the real world, but the capital asset pricing model is a little abstract. So what it assumes is that everybody is rational. It assumes that nobody has any risks that are inherent to them. They all want to do the same thing, <laughs> except for maybe a variation uh, of leverage. They all want to do the same thing. Uh, and, the, uh, uh, and so as a result, nobody will ever short uh, a stock. Uh, now this is an abstract model, and uh, I have to apologize a little bit for it, because there, there are short sales. Uh, but it's a model, and it, 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 it's actually a very important model. By the way, the United States government has historically allowed short sales, but they were briefly abolished. The U.S. government got so scared that there would be a 1929-style stock market crash that it uh, made a law, a temporary law, against short sales. No one was allowed to short these 799 stocks. So we're going to develop a theory that puts no short sale restrictions on it. We're going to assume that everyone computes, uh, does careful calculations of the mean and standard deviation of their portfolio return. And let's see what, what that implies. What it, what it does imply is that there will be an optimal portfolio uh, and uh, we should be on what's called an efficient portfolio frontier. This, I won't explain this. This is from David Swenson's book uh, about how he moved Yale to the optimal portfolio. When he, when he took over management of Yale's portfolio, uh, it was originally uh, not well managed and it was not, optim it was not optimal. So uh, here it shows, this is his account of the movement of the Yale portfolio toward the uh, uh, efficient frontier uh, between 1990 and the year 2000. Uh, so we have scientific management of portfolios here at Yale. So we'll come back to understanding what this is. So just a general question about investing. How are, uh, 
how are sort of unsophisticated middle class people supposed to invest their money now with the interest rates so low? You know, like what what is there to do? Like what can these people do? <laughs> Well, interest rates are starting to go up, <laughs> so maybe wait five years. <laughs> uh, now, uh, it, here's, it, it, here's a fundamental issue about rationality, and uh, m most people are not financial whizzes, as, as you, your question implies. Uh, and uh, so what should we do? Should we have the government invest for them? But somehow there's something wrong about that, too because uh, the governments don't have a particularly good record of deciding on investments either. Uh, the United States has, a, has been an example of capitalist institutions going way back. We have had uh, lively stock markets and uh, other kinds of speculative markets. Uh, people have lost money and been taken advantage of over the years. But on the other hand, it produces an atmosphere of attention to business that produces a general culture of uh, sympathy to uh, business. You know, if you invest in businesses, then you will be less likely to vote for a strong man leader who will, uh, who will corral businesses. So uh, the U.S. has set an example to the world about just letting, uh, letting some of these things happen. So, you know, you've got this guy, Thomas Edison, with these electric lights. He might be a nut, <laughs> who knows, but some people invested in him. Uh, and th there were other stories that didn't work out so well. Uh, but uh, on balance, over 100 or 200 years, the U.S. system has looked pretty good, and it's become spread. I mean, the, uh, not just the U.S., but I'm saying the, having free markets and involving people at large in some investing decision. Uh, it has worked out well, even though it doesn't work out well for everyone. 